Hello, hello and welcome. I know that um, others are still joining us and I'll let them come in during my introduction. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for joining us. Um, as many of you know, I'm Mara Walsh and I'm hosting our tour today to Prague. I have opened this event um, up on our Facebook page, Girl Travel Tours. So we have um, many, many people coming in the Zoom call, but we also have a lot of people joining us from Facebook. I will share a little bit about myself for those that are new to our tours. I am a travel group leader and I use EF Tours and their adult division Go Ahead Tours as my travel partners. I started leading tours as a Girl Scout leader, um, taking girls and their families to international destinations every summer. I've since expanded my travel program and added adult only tours as well as family friendly tours. I've traveled all over the world with groups as large as 70 and as small as 15 or 16, depending on the tour and the interest. I know there's a lot of people on this virtual tour that have been on several of our past virtual tours, so welcome back and also welcome to our newcomers. It actually has become so popular that I believe I may um, host more virtual tours by the end of this COVID lock-in than I have done physical tours, but we shall see. I've done several tours in the past few weeks, including Rome, Edinburgh, Paris, London, Peru, Ireland, Greece, and Ecuador. And I know many of you have joined us for many of them. But if you did miss any uh, and you want to access the recording, they are available on my website, girltraveltours.com, which I believe is also posted on the slide that you see. And we have several more tours in the works including coming up is Egypt, a literary tour of the UK, Russia, uh, Madrid's Prado Museum, China, the Amalfi Coast, an African safari, New Zealand, Bavaria, Munich, and an Oktoberfest in Germany. And I'm sure we'll add more to the list as time goes on. You can register for future tours and view all the recording of the past tours at girltraveltours.com slash virtual tours. But today we are off to Prague, a destination I've never visited, but look forward to in the future. Before we get going, I wanna share with you a few ways for you to interact with us during this event. One, feel free to ask questions as the tour goes on. You can ask questions about Prague, the tour director, my travel program, or anything else that you want to have addressed live using the Q&A, and that's on the toolbar of your Zoom toolbar, which is either at the bottom or the top of your screen. If you have a question that you want to send directly to me that you do not want to have addressed on the live forum, please chat it and I'll respond to you directly. I also like to always um, include an interactive poll just to see what your what your connection is to the destination that we are going to. So I'm gonna launch that right now. The question is, what's your connection to Prague? I've been there and I love it. I have a trip booked for the future. I have a trip booked now. I plan to go in the future, but haven't had, had a time to book it, or I'm solely interested in this virtual experience. So as people start to respond to that poll question, I'm going to give you a minute. We have about 70% responding. I'm going to close it off at this point. It looks to me like a lot of people plan to go there in the future. I'm going to show you the results of the poll. About 40% plan to go in the future. A lot of our audience loves these virtual tours. And there's been a lot of people, a third of the people that have been there before. So that's awesome. Regardless, of how much you know about Prague, we hope to enhance that today on this virtual tour. And as everyone knows, a tour would not be complete without a fantastic tour director. A tour director is like a personal travel concierge who stays with your group from start to finish, shares a world of knowledge, manages all your travel plans, and makes sure your experience is stressless and full of great experiences. These Gals and gents are by far the most important people in the group. And you can imagine if they're not travel, if we're not traveling, they're not working. 
And, you know, I'm hoping that these virtual tours will not only keep our desires travel alive, but allow a tour director to do what he does best, sharing his knowledge and passion for a destination while earning a, a few tips along the way. So I am so happy to bring Lewis back for the second tour of the summer. For those that remember him, Lewis led us through Edinburgh earlier this summer. And, and thankfully, Lewis is an expert guide in Prague as well. So today, Lewis will lead us through this magnificent city. Lewis, it is all up to you and you can take it away. I'm gonna mute myself and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you can. Okay, people should be able to hear me now, I think. I'm gonna share my screen with all participants. Hold on. Uh, here we go. Voila. Okay, I'm hoping, I can't see any of the hundreds and hundreds of you that are connected, but I'm hoping uh, that you can all see the full screen now. You can see this image of, of Prague. Um, and you can hear me and see me uh, talking. Uh, what a very, very strange experience to be doing a, a Zoom call with more than 700 people. I have to say that when I did the one at Edinburgh, I had never even done a Zoom call before. And the last one was quite a lot less people. So welcome to everybody. Uh, and also happy to see that so many of you have been to Prague before. Um, and so I'm hoping that today, over the course of the next little period of time, while I, while I do this presentation and guide you a bit through Prague, I hope that for those of you that have been before, uh, you'll learn some new things or see some things that maybe you didn't see when you were there. Uh, and for those of you that, that have not been, hopefully it will pique your interest and, and give you desire to go in the future. So I'm going to tell you just a little tiny bit about myself, just so you know who I am. My name is Lewis. I am from Scotland. I'm from Edinburgh. Um, and I live in the south of France, in Marseille, which is where I'm calling you from just now. Um, I've been working for EF for just over 10 years. Um, and I work in a, in a lot of different countries and a lot of different cities. And I have to say that Prague is definitely one of my favorite places to, to guide people. I first went to Prague actually when I was 18 or 19. Uh, I hitchhiked there from Scotland and I remember arriving, I remember really vividly arriving and it was really early in the morning, it was winter and there was snow and looking at the architecture, like the architecture that you see here in this picture and also like some of this architecture you see in this picture, this is the Charles Bridge, I remember looking at this architecture and feeling like I was very, very, very far away from home and something I found very strongly affecting the first time I went there was realizing how east in, in, in Europe I was, I'd never been so, so far east in Europe. And so the architecture looks different, the people look different, everything's just a bit different. So my plan today is that I'm going to talk to you for about maybe like 10, max 15 minutes about the Czech Republic in general and about some sort of Czech, some Czech history uh, and um, some things to think about in general about the country and about Prague. And then I'm going to give you a bit of a, a, bit of a walking tour um, a bit of a walking tour in the city and we're going to look at the castle district we're going to go down into the old town and we're going to visit the old jewish quarter um, and we're going to have a look at the old town square and then i'm going to talk a little bit about prague and and what it's like today um okay so i guess uh Depending on your age, um, depending on how old you are, you'll have different ideas in, in, your, in your head about Prague. Maybe some of you will have the name Czechoslovakia in your, in your head. Some of you will have the Czech Republic in your head. Um, but basically, the Czech Republic, as it's called now, it's a small landlocked country of about 11 million people. Okay? It's, what it's really famous for is uh, beautiful scenery. So lots of uh, forests. About a third of the country is covered in ancient woodlands. Uh, and caves and waterfalls and rivers. It's quite kind of lush, uh, lush countryside uh, and architecture. It's really, uh, when people think about Prague, a lot of people think about Prague, about, a lot of people think about architecture, sorry. So beautiful scenery, magical architecture, a sort of rich literary tradition and literary history. I don't know if the names, for example, among many of Milan Kundera or Franz Kafka, maybe ring any bells for people. An artistic and a musical history. Uh, it's famous revolution. Um, we're going to talk about the revolution today, the Velvet Revolution, as it was called. And it's cafe culture. And also for lots of people traveling there today in today's period, and really in every, in every period for the last thousand years, beer. So a lot of people think about beer when they think about the Czech Republic. 
So how long has the Czech Republic existed? This is one of the sort of first questions I wanted to pose. It's actually quite a new country. The Czech Republic has actually only existed since 1993, okay? Before 1993, the Czech Republic didn't exist. There was a country called Czechoslovakia, okay, which you can see here. And Czechoslovakia included Slovakia, Moravia, and Bohemia. Okay, so we're gonna, you're going to hear those words again, Moravia and Bohemia, the two sort of the main provinces in, in the Czech Republic. And in 1993, former Czechoslovakia, it split up, okay, and it made the Czech Republic with Moravia and Bohemia, you can see here on the left, and it made uh, Slovakia, the Slovak Republic on the right, okay. But even before that, okay, so, so what, you, what you have now is something like this. This is a map of the Czech Republic now. You can see Bohemia on the left and you can see Moravia on the right. But what you had before that, uh, where it was, it was a, a bigger country, okay? Um, and if you look at the borders as well, here we're bordered by Germany, Australia, by Poland, by Hungary. And you imagine it's very, uh, very sort of dense, very foresty, okay, is the, is the kind of terrain. So basically, um, the people here, the people that are indigenous to the Czech Republic, um, and, well, hold on, maybe I'm going to stop a little second here. I'm getting messages about speaking louder. I wonder if there's something I can, uh, I can do to make that better. I'm speaking kind of as quite loudly and quite close to the computer, um, but we are working on it. Okay, I'm just going to keep, keep continuing and, and hopefully you can hear me. Um, where was that? Yeah, the people who are indigenous to this part of the world, to the, the Czech Republic um, and, and to former Czechoslovakia, are, are Slavs, okay? So if any of you have been on any of the, the, other, the other virtual trips that Mara has organized um, and you've heard other people talking, very often we talk about uh, Celtic culture, people coming from a, from a Celtic culture. And in fact, here, this far east, we're not talking about Celts, we're talking about Slavs, okay? Uh, the Slavs were a sort of Indo-European ethno- linguistic group from the north of the Danube and from east of the Elbe, okay? And so you have a, a Slavic culture in the Czech Republic. From about the 8th or the 9th century, uh, Moravia and Bohemia, the two of them, start to be more sort of uh, serious contenders in the European scene. So back then, a thousand years ago, Europe was like thousands of small kingdoms, okay? And Moravia and Bohemia were two of them that, that really began to take prominence around the, the 900s and the, the 10th century, yeah, the 10th century. Um, they were sometimes fighting each other, they were sometimes friends with each other, uh, but in general they were pretty consistently uh, in opposition to something called the Holy Roman Empire. So maybe you've heard of the Holy Roman Empire, it was a kind of, uh, it's a bit of a stupid name, really, because actually it wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't really an empire. It was kind of like a large federation of, uh, of, of states that existed from the Middle Ages right up until the 19th century. And so the Holy Roman Empire was, was interesting also because they elected their Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, and so this was in a time when not so many people were elected, so that was already quite, quite unusual. Uh, and as I say, Bohemia and Moravia, they were not such big fans of the Holy Roman Empire, until something quite good happened for them in, in the 12th century, which is when Charles IV uh, of Bohemia, this guy, uh, he became the Holy Roman Emperor. Okay, so this was a really big deal. You had their king, their guy, uh, who came from this place, who suddenly ascended to this sort of massive stage of European power. And this meant that what we now call the Czech Republic entered really a golden age of its history, okay? Where uh, this person, Charles IV, was, was able to put put the Czech Republic really on the map, even if it didn't exist as the Czech Republic in this period, okay? Now he was really important for lots of things. He loved education. He built the Charles University in Prague. Uh, he's responsible for a lot of the very beautiful buildings that we think of in, in Prague today for the redevelopments of the cathedral, for the building of the Charles Bridge. He spoke four languages. He was considered to be a sort of very uh, cultured and very intelligent ruler and monarch, okay? Um, here he is again, looking very benevolent and happy. This is a statue of him that, that is in Prague. And so it, kind of everywhere in Prague, you see Charles Bridge, Charles University, Charles da da da. Mostly we're talking about Charles IV of Bohemia. Okay, so he's kind of the big hotshot king for, for the Czech people. Um, so he does a lot. You have this golden age for the Czech Republic in the, in the 1200s. Uh, and in the 1300s, well, in, in I guess 1400s, you have the beginning of the Czech Reformation. 
So um, I'm sure you all know a little bit about the Reformation. Usually the figures that really pop into our head would be uh, Martin Luther, right, in, uh, in Germany, or Henry VIII in, in uh, England. In the Czech Republic, you have something which actually really predates them. This is really interesting. Okay, so the Reformation globally, uh, for anyone that's interested, um, was a movement to challenge the orthodoxies of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church had been in power for a super long time, and the Reformation wanted to call into question some of that power and some of that corruption. And so actually you have this dude here, Jan Hus, who also known as John Hus sometimes, who was from the Czech Republic, and he kind of kick-started the Reformation there. And the Czech Republic went kind of went kind of quite quite well with him and became a kind of new pro Protestant uh, religion. So they rejected Catholicism. He was, however, burned at the stake in the Old Town Square. I'm going to show you later where he was burned at the stake. But this is a solid kind of 200 years um, before lots of other places would do their Reformation. So it's quite interesting. People don't really talk about him. He's, he's a little bit forgotten. Um, then something kind of not so good happened for the Czech Republic, which is that the the um, the Habsburg, the Habsburgs got control of the Czech Republic. So again, it's a bit confusing with the terminology. I'm saying Czech Republic. Czech Republic obviously didn't exist then, and more was we're talking about Bohemia and Moravia. But the the Habsburg family, um, who were this huge, incredibly powerful Austrian royal family, they took control of, of Moravia and of Bohemia. And actually, that was kind of miserable for the Czech people. Okay, that wasn't very, very, very good. Okay, back in the sort of 15th, 16th century, there was really a lot of this where you'd have one sort of big centralized power controlling lots of very small powers, kind of telling them what to do, bossing them around. And so, for example, you know, the language everybody spoke in the Czech Republic in Moravia and Bohemia was Czech, okay? But because of the Habsburgs, the official language was German. So they ruled for a long time, and actually it was kind of a bit of a, a, bit of a dark ages, really, for the Czech people, okay? So in the 1600s, 1700s, not that much exciting stuff was happening in Moravia and, and Bohemia. Okay, they were having they were a bit like a kind of slightly forgotten, slightly oppressed colony of the Habsburgs. Okay, but then in the 1800s there was a industrial revolution. Okay, and Czech identity started actually gaining a lot more momentum. People start momentum. This is kind of one of the big problems in the build-up to World War One, right? Was that you had these huge big powers that controlled all of these different countries and that flattened all of these different identities. And in the build-up to World War One, a lot of them were kind of saying, actually, you know what? We want our own country, or we want our right to govern ourselves, or we want uh, we want our, our own ability to have a, a parliament. Okay. And a bigger figure in that in the Czech Republic was this man here on the left with his little goatee, uh, Thomas Masaryk. Okay. And as World War One finished, I'm sure many of you know about this. As World War One finished. Uh, and the Habsburgs were really breathing their dying breaths, okay, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire was kind of crumbling down to the ground. Um, Masaryk took his moment and united Bohemia, Moravia, and Slovakia into Czechoslovakia, okay? So that's at the end of World War I. Uh, that he comes together and he says, look, these three countries, these three small Slavic countries, they share enough between them to uh, legitimize us making them into a country in and of itself, okay? So he, he did that just after World War, World War I. By the beginning of the 1930s, there wasn't so much economic boom happening, uh, and lots of people in what is now the Czech Republic, or what was then Czechoslovakia, were looking much more towards Germany, okay, in the 1930s. There was a lot of movement, actually, in Czechoslovakia for, for people to be, yeah, more economically close to Germany, more culturally close to Germany. And in 38, France and the UK, the, the allies, they had this idea that if they could let the Germans, who were, of course, the Nazis in this period, this was National Socialism, if they could let the Germans take part of the, what is now the Czech Republic, that could potentially be quite a good way to avoid war. Okay, and so there's a kind of agreement that maybe it would pass into Nazi hands, but actually Hitler wanted it all. And so in 39, they, they took over the whole country. Okay, um, and so uh, the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia as it was then, was fully under Nazi control. It's a bit more complicated than just saying uh, it was occupied by the Nazis. You know, it wasn't necessarily an, inf an invasion in, in, in the same sense as in, in other places. But, but either way, uh, the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia was under Nazi control. Okay? There was also a lot of resistance, as there was kind of everywhere in Europe. Uh, famously, they put uh, an SS general, um, Reinhard Heydrich, in charge. And in 1941, he was actually, he was assassinated by the, the Czech resistance. Okay, apparently Hitler was so mad that he had the inhabitants of two entire towns in the Czech Republic killed. 
okay? So the ramifications of uh, Nazism on the Czech Republic were enormous. We're gonna talk later on today about um, Jewish culture, Jewish history of the Czech Republic. But for now, I will just tell you that the, you know, the Nazis kill over 80,000 of the Jews of, of, of Prague alone. Um, so the, the decimation of, of Nazi Germany on, on, on Prague was, was massive, okay? Now, after the war, after World War II finished, you know, the Soviet Union, they liberated a lot of Nazi territories. And, you know, a lot of different areas in Europe were kind of carved up, some to be under Soviet control, some to be under Allied control. And in fact, just after World War II, in '46, there was an election and... Um, communists came to power, okay? They came to power in, in the Czech Republic. And at the beginning, they, it was still Czechoslovakia then. At the beginning, they were very, very popular. Stalin was quite happy. This was quite a big new territory to be, to be part of the Soviet Union. And in the beginning, in the late 1940s, people were quite happy with this communist government, but very quickly, they got kind of less happy about it, okay? And by the 1960s, people were actually very miserable, okay? It was very, very closed. It wasn't even economically flourishing. That's the thing. You know, they couldn't even be like, oh, culturally, our life is a bit miserable, but at least the economy is strong. It's like life culturally was miserable and the economy was weak, okay? People didn't really have any access to even European uh, or American Western culture. You know, people really did not have access to that. Uh, I have one little fun, funny story that I thought I would tell you from there. Not funny story, it's actually quite sad, but an interesting story. So uh, this big mustache, mustachioed man here, you might recognize as Joseph Stalin. I uh, was the head of the Soviet Union for a long time. Um, this was in, in Prague. This was actually, the, it's the biggest ever statue of, of Stalin that was ever made. It was made in Prague. It was absolutely massive, okay? And they put it up in the 50s. Stalin dies. Very quickly, the Soviet Union realizes that actually maybe Stalin kind of overstepped his mark and that actually maybe they should begin a kind of de-Stalinization process. And so in the 1960s, less than 10 years after they built this enormous statue, boom, they blow the whole thing up, which I always think is, is quite, it's quite funny. Um, sort of quite bad planning on their part. And then they replaced it later, I think in the 80s and 90s, with this metronome. So if any of you ever go to Prague and you see this metronome, or for those of you that have been to Prague and remember this metronome, uh, what used to be in its place was this giant figure of Stalin. Okay, so there we go, quite like that story. Uh, anyway, we got to the 60s, people were very miserable in 60. Eight, they lifted censorship, okay, and there was like a big, big movement for for uh, democracy and to get people sort of uh, out of the controls of, of the Soviet Union, as it were. You have to think about the 1960s and what was happening else in, uh, elsewhere in the world. You know, you had the African American Civil Rights Movement, where you guys are. You had the Women's Movement, the Gay Liberation Movement, the Irish Republican Movement. You had sort of civil rights movements taking off around the world, and so they had one also in in the Czech Republic. Now the Soviets were very, very scared about this happening. And so they sent the army in. So that's what these photos are from. These are from the demonstrations in, in 1968 and 1969 that were about making freedom of the press, about making Czechoslovakia more democratic, okay? Um, anyway, that didn't go so well. Um, but then when we get into the 80s, we have Gorbachev here. Here you see him giving his famous uh, socialist fraternity kiss. You have Gorbachev who comes to control in the Soviet Union and things begin to sort of calm down a little bit, okay? And so here, this is in Prague, this is in Wenceslas Square in 1989 when they have their Velvet Revolution. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Velvet Revolution before. Um, Velvet Revolution, it was called the Velvet Revolution because it was so smooth. It was almost completely nonviolent, all right? Just, it, people had just had enough. And in 1989, they filled up the streets and they said, enough is enough, we want the fall of communism. And so in 1989, communism fell in the Czech Republic, in Czechoslovakia. And this is Vaclav Havel here, uh, looking out at these crowds. So that happened in 1993, Czechoslovakia split up into the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic. And in 2004, they both joined the European Union. So 16 years ago, they joined the European Union. Uh, weirdly, the Czech Republic, for lots of reasons that are a little bit outside of my comprehension, uh, they were not hit by the 2008 financial crash, okay? They actually came through it very strongly uh, with a really sort of improved, not improved, but not destroyed economy, okay? Which means that a lot of young people did not flee the Czech Republic as they would have other countries in this sort of region. Uh, a lot of people stayed and there were a lot of jobs and very good employment in the last sort of 10, 15 years. Well, sorry, I spoke for a long time there about the history of the Czech Republic. Now we're going to move on actually to Prague. You're looking at a, a, an image of Prague here of the Vltava River. 
I want to say also, if there's anyone Czech that's listening uh, today, that's watching, uh, I want to say I'm really deeply sorry for my pronunciations. It's really, they're not good and I, and I know they're not good and I'm a little bit ashamed. So apologies to any Czech people that are, that are here. Uh, you're looking at this picture of Prague, of the, the Charles Bridge, the most, one of the most iconic bridges. We're going to talk about it a bit, a bit later. But I just want to look at this picture and think about Prague today as a kind of cosmopolitan, connected, modern European city and how amazing that it's up there in Europe's sort of top 10 destinations, considering that less than 30 years ago, well, actually more than 30 years ago now, they had a revolution which toppled quite a brutal sort of communist regime, which has been in place since the end of World War II. It's quite amazing how things change, what a globalized world we live in, how impossible it would have been to imagine that 35 years ago that Prague would become such a tourist destination. There's about 1.3 million people in Prague, about two in the greater Prague area, and it's a very sort of hustling and bustling and, and modern city, okay? That's my kind of little introduction. We're gonna, next we're gonna talk about the old town. It's actually quite misleading that I've called it the old town. I'm kind of regretful of, of writing this title. Uh, but we're gonna talk about the area around the castle and the, the complex of, of the castle, okay? We have this area called Praski Hrad. Okay, that's the first pronunciation. Again, very sorry to anyone who's Czech who is in here. If you have a look at this map, you can see you have the river that curves down in this, in this shape and you can see in on the right, you have most of the real old town, Yosefov, which is the Jewish quarter, Stare Mesto, the old town square, and then you cross the bridge and then you have the castle, okay? So the castle is up on the left-hand side. Now, what do we think about when we think about castles? Uh, I could imagine that we don't think, uh, we think about things that don't really look like this. This looks more like a sort of administrative building. In fact, it's interesting, it's the largest castle complex in the world, okay? It's about 70,000 square meters. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and the earliest buildings in it were founded in the 800s, okay? So it's really, really old, even if many of the buildings are very, very new, okay? And it got built into a kind of lavish palace complex under, you guessed it, Charles IV and his son, Wenceslas II, all right? Later, it was abandoned for a little while. One of the most important buildings in, in this complex is right in the middle, you guessed it, the huge big one, and this is St. Vitus Cathedral, okay? This is where they coronated, they did the coronations for most of their kings. It's one of the most important religious buildings in the country. It's the seat of the archbishop, it's Roman Catholic. Seven of patron saints are buried in this, in this cathedral. Uh, and there has been a church on the site for about 1100 years, okay, since the, since the ninth century. But Charles IV, again, it was him that did a lot of uh, improvements and him that really added to this and made a lot of the bits that we recognize as very Gothic today. So if you look at this architecture, you can really see how Gothic it is, okay? It's pointing up high to the sky to try and get closer to God. Uh, you have uh, gargoyles to ward off evil spirits, but also to help with drainage. You have lots of images around the side engraved into the stone. Uh, this was to help people understand the Bible in, in those times when people couldn't read. They wanted churches to be sort of uh, books in themselves that, that could be read from the outside. So anyway, this is the front of St. Vitus Cathedral. And inside it's very gaudy and very decorated and there's lots of silver and lots of gold. It's really very bling. Uh, the inside of this church uh, and you have one of the one of the more famous ones is the the chapel of saint wenceslas which is in there and a lot of people they want to go and see this this is a big sort of religious building it's one of the many buildings in the castle complex as you come out of the castle complex to start walking down to oh there we go. To start walking down towards the old town, you have to walk through this street, which is actually very, very famous in Prague. Any of you that have been to Prague, I'm sure you will have been here before. This is called the Golden Lane, okay? It got its name originally because many of the goldsmiths that were no doubt finding employment up in the castle, they were working and living in here. But around any kind of castle structure, you always have uh, lots of small houses made to support the masons, the brick workers, the carpenters, all of the tradespeople that go into supporting something like a castle. And these small houses, which are kind of these kind of beautiful medieval relics, they were actually inhabited right up until World War II. Okay, very famous resident number 22 there, the blue building on the left uh, was Franz Kafka. Okay, so right up until uh, World War II, people lived in these buildings. As you go down the hill, this is a view looking from the other side back towards the castle. You're looking at this neighborhood, which is called Malastrana, the lesser town, okay? It's very picturesque, lots of cobbles, and it's kind of the area between the castle and the river. 
And what crosses the castle area with the real old town is this bridge at the bottom here, the Charles Bridge, okay? Here you can see one of the towers on the castle side of it, and you can see it when it's a bit quieter. But this bridge, I mean, look at it, it's so, uh, it's very iconic, okay? It's an iconic sort of um, Prague image. It was built in the 14th century, okay, by, by Charles IV, again, the, the one that built everything. And it's got these 30 Baroque statues on it, these very sort of atmospheric uh, statues. Interestingly, it was the first solid bridge that crossed from east to west, okay? And I know it's really hard to imagine a time where something as simple as a stone bridge could have opened up trade, but it was really important for opening up trade because at this point, there were, it was not easy to traverse this river. There were no existing bridges. So when they built it, it really kind of changed the connectedness of the city of Prague, okay? And therefore also the kingdom of, of Bohemia. There's an actual, there's a legend that Charles IV, he laid the, the first stone himself at 5.31 a.m. on the 9th of July, 1357, because he was a believer in numerology, okay? And then time and the date make a palindrome, so it's the same backwards as it is forwards. And he believed that this would give good luck and strength to the bridge so that it could really last for a long time, okay? Um, I think often when you see postcards of, of uh, the Czech Republic and you see postcards of Prague, you see postcards of, of this bridge, okay? Normally in real life, there's about a thousand people trying to cross it, trying to take selfies with every statue. But this is what it looks like at sunset or uh, sunrise when it's a little bit quieter, okay? Next, we cross the river and we walk down a little bit into the old town. I'm gonna have a small drink of water. And we come into the old Jewish ghetto. And this for me is really the, the, mo the most interesting story that I'm going to talk to you about today, okay? Um, the old Jewish district is called Yosivov, okay? And it's one of the, in the Czech Republic, it was one of the oldest Jewish communities in all of Europe, okay? By the 18th century, Jews made up almost a quarter of the population of Prague, okay? So it was a really huge, huge, huge population. And by, the, by today, there are literally between two and 10,000 Jews left in the city. So it's a very small population now, definitely 2,000. And we don't know if it's between two and 10 because, because of all of the things to do with anti-Semitism that happened in the 20th century. A lot of people do not register themselves as Jews anymore. Okay, so there's at least 2,000 Jews. At one time there were well, well over 100,000 Jews living in, in Prague alone, okay? So the story of the Jews, uh, maybe some of you are familiar with Jewish history, but the story of the Jews traditionally, and this is a, a painting of Moravian Jews, the story of the Jews is often one of wandering, okay? One of not having necessarily a very fixed home in Europe. Uh, and usually Jewish history is imbued with these ideas of um, survival and endurance. So being able to endure hard things, uh, community and solidarity, knowledge, resilience, and these are things that Jews have had to have in European history in, in, in order to survive, okay? But the first Jews came to the Czech Republic in, in the 10th century, so about a thousand years ago, okay? And they sought protection and they were granted a ghetto in the city in, the, in, which, to, in which to live. So ghetto is an interesting word to think about today. In today's sense, most usually it talks about a sort of more, ghetto means a, a more deprived, usually economically deprived, socially deprived neighborhood. Uh, often when we think about ghetto, we think about ghettos in the Nazi senses, you know, areas that were created to control certain populations. But also in the Middle Ages, Jewish ghettos, uh, those walls were not just to keep people in, they were also to keep threats out. So they were ways for Jews to live autonomously. And from the 10th century, Jews, Jews lived in, in Prague. And as early as the 10th century, were victims to some quite horrible pogroms. So a pogrom is a sort of big anti-Semitic attack. Uh, often these attacks were in times of financial uh, economic crisis and part of the idea was that Jews were often money lenders okay and so often when people got into a kind of financial crisis nobody had enough money the Jews often still had enough money and so people were able to blame them the irony is or the real injustice of this is is that in the middle ages lending money was considered a Christian sin and so many of the laws in many countries in Europe had been created to make, make a situation where only Jews or only non-Christians really were allowed to lend money. So often the very job which Jews were forced into and cornered into was the job which was their undoing. So they experienced a lot of violence in the 1000s and the 1100s in the ghetto uh, in, in, in Prague. Uh, and from the 13th century, they put a wall up. So there was a wall around the Jewish ghetto. It was more closed in, okay? Here's the Jewish cemetery. The Jewish cemetery, what an amazing place to go. I strongly recommend that, uh, that you go and visit if ever you have the chance. It's one of the oldest uh, Jewish cemeteries in, um, 
in Europe. It was open from 1439 to 1787. And there's a lot of Jewish, a lot of rules around um, burial in Jewish culture. You know, you can't be, you can't be cremated. You have to be buried relatively fast. Uh, and so that you don't really move the bodies after they've been buried. And so in this very small area over that many hundreds of years, they had to double up a lot. And in fact, they did more than double up. And in places in the Jewish cemetery, the bodies are 12 deep. Okay, so in a very, very small area, you have apparently 200,000 uh, buried Jews. Okay, which is incredible. It's amazing that it still exists despite Nazism, but I read an article once which was talking about how it was one of the very few sites that Hitler had uh, singled out to be kept uh, in order to be able to have some historical artifacts about who the Jews were after they had all been uh, exterminated. Whether this is true, I don't know, but I read an article about this once. Um, and you can see they're very on top of each other because, uh, well, because there's so many of them. Here also, uh, this is a little picture, it's a news story that came out in the 1980s, which was that people, researchers realized that in Wenceslas Square on the other side of, of Prague, some of the cobblestones that had been made under, under communism were made from the cut up graves from, from the, the Jewish cemetery. It's quite horrible. So there's a bit of a campaign in the, in the 80s to, to find them and to try and repatriate them to the cemetery. Okay. Now, one of the reasons we're coming into the cemetery today on our tour is because we want to talk about the person whose grave this is. Uh, and that person is Rabbi Judah Lo Ben Bezalel, who was born in 1525, more colloquially just known as Rabbi Lo. So Rabbi Lo was super, super important uh, for the Jews in, in Prague and kind of all over Europe. He was a, a big scholar, like a theologian. Here he is. It's a very menacing statue of him, which is also in Prague, just in, in the Jewish quarter itself. One of the things that he is most famous for is the creation of the golem. Okay, so if you haven't heard this story before, I find it very touching and interesting, or it's really rich in symbolism. The idea of the golem is basically a monster made of clay that is brought alive to, to protect people in a, in a time of trouble. But really, the idea of the golem is just the idea that you can make a creature out of clay. And so in the Talmud, which is one of the Jewish holy books, uh, even Adam in the Bible, like Adam and Eve, is talked about as being a type of golem. But the, the classic golem, the really classic golem, is the golem of Judah, Rabbi Judah Lo in Prague. Here's another image. Um, so maybe I'll stay here. And basically the idea is that, that you make a figure out of clay, uh, and this figure, when you activate it by putting a piece of paper with the name of God, Hashem, into its mouth, it comes alive and it can protect the Jews in times of need. So you can imagine why this idea was appealing to Jews in history. And in the Middle Ages, lots of sort of mystic scholars, they put a lot of time into researching how this could happen, if it was possible. And supposedly, Rabbi Lowe, he's the one that really did it. Okay, And I really like this idea that um, an idea can bring such force into, into being. So the idea you take this piece of paper, you put it in his mouth, and then this clay has power. So the story goes that Rabbi Lo went to the Vlatava River, he made this man out of clay, and then he brought him back to the ghetto and he gave him life by putting the Shem in his mouth, and he then protected the Jews against attack or against expulsion from Rudolf II. There's a million different directions that that story then goes. Uh, most of them involve the idea that on the Friday night, you have to kind of turn the golem off, you take the thing out of his mouth, and then he goes to sleep so that he can rest on the Sabbath. And there's a few different versions of the stories, you know, like one where he loses control, one where he falls in love. And most of them end up with the golem being a kind of monstrous figure, okay? And the rabbi has to do something about it. Today, the golem looks a bit like this. This is a kind of common souvenir trinket in Prague. You see lots of shops selling things like this, t-shirts. You even see kind of kebab shops that are called the golem kebab shop. Um, anyway, this is, a, this is a still from a 1920s horror film made about the golem in Prague. And the, the, the idea is that the golem became a kind of frightening figure at the end. And the rabbi had to take his body uh, of clay and store it in the attic of this building, which is the old new synagogue, that maybe one day he could come back to protect the Jews of Prague. So this is the old new synagogue today. It's a really a beautiful building. You can also visit this if you're in Prague. Um, it's called, it was built in, tw I want to say 1270, 1270. It's one of the first Gothic buildings in Prague. It's funny that it's called the old new synagogue. It's because when they built it, it was the new synagogue. But then when they started building new ones, they were so used to calling it the new one that they started calling it the old new synagogue. So today it's the old new synagogue. It still exists. Uh, and it is supposedly the attic. It is supposedly where the golem still is. There is a bit of a myth in Paris about a Nazi soldier uh, climbing into the attic during, during National Socialism to prove people wrong and then dying very suddenly. So it's a place that has a lot of mysticism 
around it. Here's the other side of it. It's very, very beautiful, beautiful building. There's the inside of it also, in case you wondered what it looks like. So the story for the Jews doesn't doesn't end well in in, in Prague or, or in the Czech Republic or or in most of Europe, uh, and in fact the Nazis opened up a camp not so far from Prague called Theresienstadt, which was meant to be a kind of transit camp in between Prague and Auschwitz. So Auschwitz, of course, was a death camp. There were lots of work camps. The Jews who lived in, in Slovakia, they went straight to Auschwitz, but it was slightly too long for the Jews that were living in what we call the Czech Republic, and so they went through this place, Theresienstadt which is the Czech concentration camp. Uh, those words above the, above the, the port, in case, you, in case you don't know them, Arbeit macht frei, it means work will set you free. And it was this that was above many of the, many of the camps that were run by the Nazis. I do a lot of guiding in, in um, concentration camps. I've, I've spent a lot of time educating young people about, about the Holocaust. And I think it's really something worth doing and something important to do uh, so that we can really think about fascism and what happened in the 1930s and 40s. And so we can think about how we can never make those mistakes again, or how important it is to do everything we possibly can to avoid them. Um, there were about 120,000 Jews in Prague before World War II. Uh, 80,000 of them were killed by the Nazis. About 25,000 managed to emigrate, and about 10,000 survived the camps and then later came back. One of them that survived the camps was this woman here, Helga Weisova. She's actually quite a famous Czech artist. She was a teenager in Theresienstadt, and she drew about between 200 and 300 drawings of everyday life for Jews in the camp, which we still have. She rolled them up and pushed them into a wall. And then her and her family got moved to Auschwitz, which she survived, and her drawings were found later. And they're one of the best archives that we have of, of what happened in Theresienstadt. Also, many children from Prague, they got onto the kinder transport and they were taken to the UK, Jewish children, um, to try and have other lives or better lives or however you want to think about it. There was actually a big movement for them going back in the last 30 years. Um, there was a, a kind of com 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 commemoration event for, for the, the Holocaust in Prague, where a lot of the kids that had been taken away, evacuated, they, they came back to visit for the first time. So now we're moving down a little bit um, in the city, a little bit further south to Staromecki na Miesti. Again, sorry about the pronunciation, or Staromak, as it's known by most Czech people, I think. This is the most significant square in historical Prague. A real crossroads, a kind of meeting place, it was founded in the 12th century, okay, and has been a real uh, important place for Prague in, in lots and lots of different ways. I have some other photos of it in daytime and in Christmas time, you can see, you can imagine in winter, it's very atmospheric, very romantic. In fact, lots of things happened in this square that were important. One of them is that Jan Hus was burned to death here about 500 years ago. And in fact, this sculpture you can see in the middle, this kind of round thing is where Jan Hus was burned to death. There's a lot of very famous buildings as well. This big dramatic building in the background you see with the towers. This is the Church of Our Lady before Tin. Uh, really huge, huge, uh, be beautiful church on the inside and outside. Actually, there's an even nicer one in the Baroque style, which is the Church of St. Nicholas. It's in the same square, believe it or not, a completely different architectural style. And look at the Baroque interior of this church. Isn't that beautiful? Then we have all these mad different uh, architectural styles clashing together in this big old square. Uh, and here you have the old town hall on the left and you have all of these people gathered around to see something which is the astronomical clock really important astro prague was a big center for uh, as i always mix up astronomy and astrology the one that's the stars that one prague was a big center for that um, and this astronomical clock is actually one of the one of the three oldest in the world but it's the oldest that still works and so a lot of people gather here very very often to to come and see it it does a little display on the hour i think three times a day um, so that's something nice to see and then just next to that you have wenceslas square which is a bit of the connection between the old town and a kind of newer prague so you can see this looks a bit less old-fashioned and this is a bit of a bridge in, into a more modern part of town most famous for like i said the the velvet revolution which we talked about earlier Wenceslas also, I should say, I don't think I said it before, Wenceslas is uh, the patron saint of Bohemia, which is why his name crops up absolutely everywhere. Um, here's another picture from Wenceslas Square. So Prague today, we've talked really a lot about history. I'm getting there. I'm sorry, I've been talking for a little bit longer than I planned, but just five more minutes of your time, please, and then we'll do some questions. Uh, Prague today is a really bustling, welcoming, interesting place. Um, really, really a nice place to visit, or certainly I always felt very, um, 
yeah, welcomed there and that people were very friendly and, and, and generally quite open to, to tourists. It's really full of nice cafes and places to eat. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I think they've really done a lot of work in the last 20 years to, to make it a more, a more welcoming place. You know, there's a bit of a reputation sometimes in ex-communist countries that they can be a bit unfriendly. But I have to say, I never found that the case in, in Prague. One big thing is the language. Of course, they speak Czech which is, I must admit, or for me anyway, I find very, very, very difficult. The bottom ones here, I really couldn't help you with, but the top ones are kind of quite everyday and useful. So hello in Czech is ahoy, uh, which people are very happy if you say. Jak is more like, how are you? It's the same as in Polish, if we have any Poles in the group. Uh, Nazdrovya, it's kind of cheers, very similar to Russian also. For me, I mean, I speak English and I speak French, and so uh, these languages, these Slavic-based languages are really like, they explode my head a little bit. But if anybody has Russian or German uh, or Polish, um, Czech, Czech will be a lot easier. But in general, I find that, that people, are, everybody speaks English and people are very, very willing to speak English. The other thing is the currency. There's not the euro in the Czech Republic. There is the, the crown, the Czech krona, kruna, uh, with these big, beautiful old coins. Okay, That often takes people a, a little bit of time to get used to because it's something kind of weird like 28 or 29 crowns to the dollar or something like that so it's, that can be a little bit confusing um and they have a very strong economy as well the other thing they do a lot of manufacturing in the czech republic they make cars and guns and metal and all this kind of stuff skoda was the really big one i'm sure some of you have heard of used to be a bit of a joke skoda in europe and then they got bought over by volkswagen and now it's quite a sort of a, a very good car very respected car so that's something we really associate in certainly in the west of europe with the Czech Republic. The other big thing, of course, is beer. Super, super famous for beer. Uh, even when I was younger, there was always a reputation of like, the, one of the things that was really appealing about going to Prague is that a beer, the beer was incredibly, exp in, incredibly inexpensive. You know, it was like 30 cents for a liter of beer or something like this. So they're actually one of the, they're the biggest beer, per, individual, personal, the biggest beer consumers in the world. So more than Germany. Um, and export and export of beer is a huge, huge part of the industry. So there's a lot of beer tourism as well in Prague. As, as with lots of countries in Central European, it's a, Europe, it's a lot of meat and a lot of potatoes, a lot of root vegetables. Here is a dish of goulash with these sort of traditional potato dumplings, which are actually really delicious. And here's a bit of the same meal, a kind of goulash, lots of pork stews, beef stews. Uh, served inside a bread roll. They're also really good for sweet things in the Czech Republic. Um, this is this is absolutely delicious. This thing, uh, Medovic, it's like a, a kind of honey cake. Uh, and then the other one that people really really love, or that whenever I take groups, they're always going a bit a bit bonkers for, is Trudelnik, which is this kind of funnel cake. And they roll it around these wooden beams, and then they roll it and they cook it over kind of a coal fire, and it tastes kind of like smoky, charred donuts. Um, I've got this little picture here at the end to to yeah just to finish to look at an atmospheric view of the the Charles Bridge. I just spoke for just over forty minutes and I was planning on speaking for a little bit less, so I'm sorry I kept you so long. But maybe it would be nice if we can pass into some questions just now. I will tell you in advance if there's anything that I don't know, don't have any answers to your questions. I will try and say that, but I'll try my very best to answer. Uh, to answer some of them. And I hope it's been interesting uh, learning a little bit about the Czech Republic. If you haven't been, you really should go. Um, and yeah, maybe I can I can pass it. Maybe Mara, you can come back in now and then we can do some Q&A. Sure, thank you. I am going to um, share my screen again. And okay. so hello everybody. That was a great tour. Thank you, Lewis. Um, so I just wanted to put this screen up so that I, I saw a bunch of comments about um, what tours were coming up and how do you get, um, how do you register and how do you get a hold of them. So this is the list of the virtual tours that are coming up in the uh, end of the summer into the fall. You can either take a screenshot of your screen or you can go to girltraveltours.com. Um, slash virtual tours and or just girl travel tours and there's a virtual tour tab but you can check them out you'll also get this uh link in an email tomorrow after the event is over so thank you for that um as i mentioned we're going to go into a q a so uh, you'll see that there's a q a um indicator on your toolbar if you want to just tap on that and and type in your questions that would be great as the questions start coming in, I want to remind you um, 
that uh, there is a way to tip Lewis for his tour time. As you can imagine, Lewis could probably have done this tour without a lot of thought and preparation, but because it's not a physical tour and it's a tour that needs um, a lot of uh, research and, and putting a deck together to present it via Zoom, um, it does take some time. So let us all try to show our appreciation by sending a, a tip, uh, no matter how small or large, all tips are appreciated. Um, you can use Venmo, you can use PayPal, you can even write a check. Um, I did text all of you through the chat, uh, the specifics on the tipping. Uh, if you do have a question on it and you don't have Venmo or PayPal and you don't use an online app, by all means, I can uh, text you um, where to send a check. Okay. Let's move on. I think I've, I've stalled long enough to give Lewis some time to look at the Q&A. Do you think that you are in a good position, Lewis, that we can start with the Q&A and you can um, start reading some of these questions and going yes. through them? Yeah, there's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've not even read half of them yet. I know, there are a lot. We had a thousand people on the yeah. tour, so there are quite a bit of questions. So do the best you can and we'll see how far we can get. Okay. Yeah, give me two seconds. Okay, I, I guess I'll start with ones that are in the top of my list because I haven't even finished sorting them out in terms of being able to answer them. Um, here we go, let's go. Do you prefer that I click on answer live or type? Yeah, I'll click on answer yeah. live. So see which exactly, question. click on answer live and done when you do it. So I've got a question from uh, from Randy, which is, is, is it Czech, Czech Republic or Checha? Checha is a, a it's interchangeable. Uh, you can say in the same way that lots of places have a kind of English version of their name and then a, a more local version. You know, for example, Prague, Czech people don't call it Prague, they call it Praha. Uh, so Checha and Czech Republic is, uh, yeah, interchangeable. Um, okay, the next question. Can I just continue? I can go like this, Mara. Yeah. Next question is from... Go for it. Arlene, which is why did they choose a metronome as the replacement? I think the big symbolism is about uh, time, right? And measuring time. So a met metronome helps people keep rhythm. It helps people follow time. And I guess it's a little bit of a kind of self-referential, almost a little bit of a sort of ironic reference to the, the measuring and the advancement of time. Um, there is in fact another question about the metronome as well, which is just below, which is from Audrey which is where is the metronome monument in Prague? Is it near the Charles Bridge? It's not so far from the Charles Bridge. It's actually at the Chechu of most, it's a, a bridge a bit further north than the very, very famous bridge. But you're right, it is right next to one of the bridges up, up on the big hill. And if you've been there on a, in a kind of tourism situation, in a, in a group travel situation, it's very likely you would have seen it because the places that the buses drop off most commonly in Prague is right underneath it. So lots of people have seen the big metronome without necessarily knowing that it was once where there was a huge statue of Stalin. Um, oh, I like this question. Judy Johnson, I once heard that the Velvet Revolution was inspired by Lou Reed songs. So I think in it having its name, the Velvet Revolution, I, I think it's not a link to the Velvet Underground. I think it's really this thing about it being very smooth. But there was a huge, huge link in the 1960s uh, and the early 1970s between sort of countercultural uh, rock and pop music from, from the UK and from America and, uh, and what was happening in the Czech Republic, all right? It's one of the most famous ones. I think there's some questions about it further down. Is that, you know, there's this thing with John Lennon in Prague, where there's the John Lennon wall, because John Lennon was like this kind of icon for lots of this kind of pacifist generation that wanted to move towards democracy in the Czech Republic because he was singing about peace and freedom and love and na na na. And these were all of the things that people felt like they, they didn't have access to. So in a way that maybe, you know, like it's possible to imagine grow, like growing up, maybe in some of your, when you were teenagers, growing up and having your parents be like, oh, that's too rebellious to listen to the Velvet Underground or the Beatles or something. For them, it was really like a crime. <laughs> you know, it was like people would tr sneak to each other's houses and be like making sure no one was listening at the windows to be like listening to the new Beatles album. All right. So I think definitely in, in lots of parts of the Soviet Union, they felt like the more they controlled counterculture, uh, and so much culture in the 60s was counterculture, the more they controlled it, the better chance they would have, have of pr preserving communism. 
So I think the link between someone like Lou Reed and then the revolution, I imagine there were a lot of people that were right or not rioting because of the Velvet Revolution, but imagine there were a lot of people uh, that were involved that had been really inspired by that generation of sort of American and also British rock. Um, da -da 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 -da. Gwendolyn wants to know, can you visit the castle? Yes, you can visit the castle. It has one of the most confusing ticketing systems that I have to say I've ever had to deal with anywhere in Europe. So uh, I would really recommend going with a group <laughs> or try, trying to get a guide to take you into it. Yes, you can visit the castle. It's actually like I think I showed in the, in the picture. It's a complex of lots and lots and lots of, um, of buildings. And so you can get one ticket to visit most of them. And there's some gardens as well and kind of military museum and, and there's two churches, a chapel. There's a lot of buildings up there. But like I said, when, when we're looking at it, there is, um, there's nothing that really looks like what we think of a sort of castle, medieval castle. But all of those buildings or most of those buildings up there, you can visit with some exceptions. Okay. I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe that some of those buildings up there are actively used by sort of in parts, parts of the military. And so they, they remain closed. Question from Suze about the royal family. And after that, I'm really, I'm going, I'm going to be improvising, Mara. I'm going rogue because now we're at the bottom of the ones I've managed to actually read. Uh, question from Suze. Is there a royal family that still lives in the castle, like in the UK, that doesn't have power but is still royal? No. There are for sure royals or kind of nobles that are kind of kicking around the country somewhere in their expensive houses. But no, in fact, um, a big part of this thing that happened at the end of World War I when, when Czechoslovakia invented itself was about moving away from that system. And so in fact, the last person that was really in control was Charles III, not the same family as the Charles we talked about today, but one of the Habsburgs, so one of the Austrian princes. And in 1918, when that kind of all went kaput, uh, they, they left the thrones. The last official sort of king was, was 1918, and it was someone that had potentially never even set foot in the Czech Republic. So whether there are descendants of the, the Kinsky family, who were one of the most famous royal families in, in the Czech Republic, they will be there somewhere, probably with their fingers in some kind of industry, um, and with potentially big houses in the countryside. But no, they are not in, in power at all. Um, how, a question from Kim. How difficult is it for an English speaker to spend time there? I really, like I said, I think easier and easier and easier and easier. Um, like people are very, very educated. Many, many people speak English. People are very helpful. You know, when, with lots of other countries, people have a bit of this like kind of snobbish thing where it's like, like in France, people really, even if they can speak English, sometimes they'll, they'll be not that willing to, to speak English. Um, and uh, here, I mean, in the Czech Republic, I'm not in the Czech Republic, but in, in the Czech Republic, it's really not like that. Similarly to how in Germany, I feel like people are quite generally quite helpful. They, they want to speak English if they can speak English. So I don't think it's a, a place where you'd feel very blocked as an Anglophone from, from communicating with people. Um, oh God, there's so many questions. Ah, yeah, here's Jan who says, I was there in 98 or 99 and they were not very accommodating yet. Thanks for that, Jan. Yeah, I can, I mean, I can imagine, I can imagine that that, that was true. I think things have really uh, changed a lot. Um, oh, here we go. I bought an amber bracelet in Prague, says Ellen. Um, amber is actually a huge, huge, huge thing in Prague. Prague actually made part of the amber route. So people always talk about the Silk Road, right? Um, but the Amber Road was actually another one going from north to south in Europe that was a really important trade route and, and Prague was part of it. So lots and lots and lots of people um, come to Prague to buy amber. There's a lot of uh, amber shops. I have someone here who's speaking to me in French. Uh, oui, Marie Labance, oui, je suis juif. Et uh, ouais, voilà. Ouais. Um, okay, I'm just, I'm looking through them because a lot of them aren't questions, they're more like comments. So I'm just, I'm kind of sifting through them a little bit here. There are really so many of them, 110 of them. Um, bum, bum, bum.
was the golem found in the attic? I mean, this is a bit of a myth thing, isn't it? It's very, it's very hard to know. That's how the story goes. The story goes that they went, they found nothing, and then this Nazi soldier died. I mean, whether there was ever actually, whether Rabbi Lowe ever actually did anything that looked like creating a golem, we don't know. I think the story is just so rich in, uh, in, in symbolism. So no, they never officially found anything. If any of you were interested in the golem story, I like the golem story, there is a really good horror novel written about it by Gustav Meyrink called The Golem. And there is also a 1920s film made about it. So you can kind of find a lot more, a lot more stuff about it. Uh, is the housing market expensive? No, actually. The cost of living, I, I was in, in preparing this tour, I was trying to think about this and I was thinking about some of these questions and looking up some kind of average figures and trying to do some comparisons with other places. And, and uh, Prague, the average salary is going to seem really low to you. It's like twenty-two or $23,000 a year or something like that. It's very low, but actually the cost of living is very low as well. Um, and I think next to somewhere like Berlin, I mean, you're looking at really like 60% of the price. So the cost of living, it's very, very, uh, very for, um, affordable. Is the Jewish museum in one building? No, the Jewish museum, it's like there is a museum that's a bit artifacty, but actually the kind of ticket to go and see um, the, the Jewish Museum, it lets you into a whole bunch of different sites uh, in, in, the, in the Cartier, in the neighborhood. Um, so it lets you into, I think, to go and visit four synagogues, the cemetery, uh, the small museum, a, a whole bunch of different things. Best time to go to the Charles Bridge and the clock to avoid the crowds. Charles Bridge has to be very early in the morning. Like that's the that's the 100% the best time to go because in the day it's packed and in the evening you have people being like, oh, it's smart if we avoid the day and we'll get sunset. So I would say definitely the morning is the very best. With the clock, again, morning or late at night, but you won't see it moving. So the clock, you just kind of have to deal with the crowds um, because people people want to go at the time when it's doing its um doing its move. Ah, here we go. Janice, you are helping me here. Janice Oldak. Was the Jewish section completely rebuilt after World War II? Didn't Hitler want to use Prague as a museum to the Jewish culture and want to catalogue all Jewish pillaged artefacts? Really interesting. Remember I said, I, I said that I had read something about him wanting to preserve the cemetery to be used to explain, uh, to explain who the Jews were after the final solution. But that's, the, you know, the, that's interesting that you, you pose the question like that, that Prague itself would be kept. I and mean, I think that speaks... Uh, speaks a lot for the sort of uh, complexity uh, and the richness of the, the Jewish neighborhood in Prague that, that Hitler would have selected that as the one that would speak for Jewish history. Um, what is the climate like in winter? Cold, cold, snowy and cold. Um, Lewis, I like this question. Do you have any favorite films about the Czech Republic? Do you know any? Do you know what? I actually don't know if I've ever even seen a film about the Czech Republic. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, that's no good. I, I can't help with that one. Do you have any, Mara, do you have any favorite films about the Czech Republic? I am a newbie to the Czech Republic, but it's on my list now. Okay, maybe I'll do some research and I'll get back to you. Um... I'm just looking through these. A lot of these are comments. Mozart tour, it was wonderful. How the people of Prague are doing with COVID-19? Uh, COVID that I could not tell you. I have not been there. Um, ah, if you were a Jew going to visit Prague, would you feel welcome or is there still anti-Semitism if you were to visit the other non-Jewish parts of the city? It's an interesting question. I think like lots of historic Jewish places in Europe, there's a lot of Jewish tourism to go and visit them. Um, and so I think the first part of the answer to that question would be that you wouldn't necessarily stand out. And so already that in itself is a thing. Uh, I think it really depends where you go in countries that were under Nazi occupation. Um, I, I mean, anti-Semitism is still a problem here as it is everywhere in the world, but not in... I wouldn't say in enormous proportions. I've certainly been really aware of being there of seeing lots of Jewish people in the streets and, and it being seeming quite sort of integrated. We have uh, some good responses about um, film and television. So The Unbearable Lightness of Being is a film set in Prague 
and part of the Outlanders was filmed in Prague to represent how Paris looked in the late 1700s. So there's mm -hmm. a good, uh, there's a good fan interaction there to give us. Thank, some thank you, fan. The unbearable lightness of being. I didn't know there was a film about it, but it's actually a novel, also by a, a Czech writer called Milan Kundera, who one of the most famous Czech Czech uh, Czech novelists. Um, Ah, here's a book re recommendation, or not? Dun, dun, dun. Okay, these kinds of questions suggest, someone suggesting wearing comfortable shoes. I would, all, <laughs> I would always also endorse that episode, that, um, that idea. <laughs> what is Kafka's connection to Prague? Kafka was Czech. And Kafka and Kafka, Kafka lived in Prague, um, so that uh, the little blue house. Do you remember I showed in the Golden Lane coming out of the castle? It was one of the houses where, where Kafka lived. Um, oh, we've got another recommendation coming in here for the unbearable lightness of being as a film. People are saying it's good. Um, dun, dun, dun. There's a top. People are talking about a Tom Cruise movie. Ah, here we have someone who is commenting, saying that they were there the last year, uh, and they're a Jewish family, that they were there with their, their child, and it was fine, and they did not experience any uh, anti-Semitism. Someone also says the Jewish sites are important even for non-Jews. 100% would agree with that. 100, 100%. Um, I think it's really important for, for all of us, for everyone. Um, what is the diversity in the country ratio of black to white and non-white? I would really have to Google it to get you a, a st statistic-like answer, but I will say from the time that I've spent in the Czech Republic, I find it very homogeneously, homogeneously white. Um, like uh, for sure in Prague, it's a big city. You know, there, there is a black population, there's an Arab population, but I, it's, it's, it's very white. Um, again, at things like average coldest temperature, I would really have to um, have to... I'd have to Google that. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Uh, does the city get a lot of traffic? Is it easier to travel by bus or a subway? Uh, yeah, it's really easy. The public transport's pretty good. There's a really nice tram, like a proper old school Soviet style tram. Um, you know, like one of the ones where some of them are still in wood, the carriages. And there's a good subway system and a good bus system. It's got quite good public transport. And also because it's Europe, um, lots of cycling. Are the majority of people Catholic? Officially, a lot of people are Catholic, but in fact, it's actually very, very, very secular now in the Czech Republic. It has really one of the highest percentages of atheists in, in Europe, which I read the other day, which is interesting. I think that we have, ah, just one more. Sorry, someone has asked me to spell the name of the work camp that, that Prague, that Jewish people were spent to. This is for Marie, Marie Labanche. Theresienstadt. So like Theresa, T-H-E-R-E-S-I-E-N-S-T-A-D-T. -T -E -T. Theresienstadt. Like Theresa Ian Stadt. I think if you search that, you'll find it. Um, thank you for all your comments. Um, lots of these are just kind of helpful comments and recommendations of things or people saying that it made them think about their trip. So thank you to all the people that put them in. I'm sorry for any that I haven't managed to answer. Uh, there were one of two that I deliberately didn't answer because I didn't know the answer. And so if that was one of you, I'm sorry. Uh, and for the rest of you, thank you for your, your comments and thank you for listening. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis, for, uh, for giving us a great tour. And I think all of us need to now change our answers that we said in the beginning of the presentation and put Prague on our list, even if we were thinking that we were only gonna go there virtually. So um, I always thank the tour director. Thank you so very much. But in this case, with a virtual tour, it is most important to thank the audience because without you, we wouldn't keep doing these virtual tours. And as long as you want them and you keep coming, we will find tour directors who are experts in their, in their countries and we will continue to give you tours so just keep um, providing me that feedback and we'll make sure that we keep the tours going um, through the fall
So thank you again for coming out. I know that, you know, we probably took you a little bit longer than an hour, but you, most of you stayed on. We had um, a thousand people on this virtual tour. So this was by far our uh, limit um, because that's all the people we can have on a virtual tour is a thousand. And more than half of you stayed on for the entire question and answer session. So thank you again. Um, as we say, all good things must come to an end. And for that, we're going to say thank you and cheers. And if you have any questions, you can email me directly, marawalsh at gmail.com. Um, and I can help you out um, offline. But thank you again. Have a good night. And I'm going to uh, end the virtual tour.